Hey guys, so this video is going to cover the classwork that is going over section 1, topics 8 and 9. Basically simplifying radical expressions and dealing with rational and irrational numbers. So all the problems you see on the screen will be covered and explained in full. I encourage you to pause the video as need be and rewind and re-listen to things and maybe even try to work out the problems on your own before you see the solutions appear. So alright, here we go with number 1. The first thing you would notice is that we have a radical 27 in the first binomial, and you can go ahead and factor that into 9 times 3, and you would want to make that choice because 9 is a perfect square, and we are trying to simplify the square root of 27. Well, because you are taking the square root of 9 times 3, you can go ahead and take the square root of 9, which is 3, but then the radical 3 that is not a perfect square stays under the radical. Likewise, with the square root of 28, you can make that into 4 times 7, 4 being a perfect square, and 7 being the uh, number that's left over, but in any case, you would just square root the 4 and get 2, and then the 7 stays under the radical sign. Now what we have at this point are two binomials that are being multiplied together. You cannot just uh, straight up multiply. You need to do uh, what we have been calling in class the, the box, where basically you take the terms of the binomials and you write them on the top and side of the box. Uh, the 2 radical 7 and the 3 radical 3 will go on the top, and then the other 2 radical 7, and notice there is a negative sign there, let me just back it up right there, uh, a negative sign right there next to the 3, making it a negative 3 radical 3 that we have right there and you basically just multiply the combinations of the box uh, in order to fill in the terms that you will eventually combine. Uh, so basically, in the top left corner, you are multiplying 2 and 2 to get 4, because those are your whole numbers that are not under a radical sign. And then the radical 7s, when radical 7 multiplies with radical 7, it just creates a normal 7. And I will very quickly prove that by showing you that radical 7 times radical 7 is going to equal radical 49 because that is what you do with the radicals. You just multiply the two radicands together under the same radical sign. But the square root of 49, well, that's equal to 7. So I'm basically cutting out this middle step and just telling you that the square root of 7 times the square root of 7 is going to equal a normal whole number of 7. In any case, uh, continuing the box procedure, the... Uh, top right box, the 2 and the 3 will multiply to make 6, and the radical 7 and the radical 3 will multiply to make radical 21. Likewise, in the bottom left corner, the 2 and negative 3 will make a negative 6, and then the 7 and 3 will multiply to make a uh, radical 21. Oh, sorry, radical 7 times radical 3 will make the radical 21 that you see right there. Lastly, the 3 and negative 3 will multiply to make a negative 9, and then again, radical 3 times itself is a normal whole number of 3. Now that we have the box set up, we can just go ahead and simplify and then add our terms together. Uh, 4 times 7 is going to give you 28, and negative 9 times 3 is going to be negative 27, so we have 28 minus 27. Lastly, your diagonal terms have the same radicand. The square root of 21 is the same in both of these terms. So basically, they are like radicals or like terms. Whenever you have like radicals or like terms, you basically just add or combine the coefficients. And that is how you simplify them. Well, 6 plus negative 6 is going to give you a 0, and because the radical 21 is with both of those terms, it will be a 0 times radical 21. But again, remember, the 0 is multiplying the radical 21, so basically 0 times anything is 0, and we're just left with the 28 minus 27, which equals 1. The second part to number one, we have an expression over here that we need to simplify. The first thing to notice is that radical 12 is going to be radical 4 times radical 3. Uh, the whole number of 2 you can leave alone inside of the parentheses, but radical 48, that becomes radical 16 times radical 3. Again, you are trying to find a perfect square that divides the number. 
48 is divisible by many numbers, but 16 times 3 also gives you 48, and 16 is a perfect square. Go ahead and square root your perfect squares. The square root of 4 is 2, and the radical 3 just tags along. And then inside of the parentheses, the 2 stays the same, but the radical 16, you can square root that and get 4. The radical 3 inside the parentheses stays the same as well. Next, take note of the fact that 2 is multiplying 4. 2 times 4 is 8, so we can just replace that with an 8. Next, it's important to note that all of these terms are being multiplied together. The 2 times the radical 3 times the 8 times the radical 3. And I'm just going to go ahead and rewrite the 7 radical 3 right underneath that. We're almost done. Something that you need to always remember about fractions is when you can simplify by canceling a common factor. In this case, notice how in the denominator there is a radical 3, and in the numerator we have two copies of radical 3. Whenever you have a factor that is the same in both the numerator and the denominator, mind you, we have to be multiplying the entire numerator in order to do this, you can always cancel out the common factor because radical 3 is essentially dividing itself. And anything divided by itself is equal to 1. And 1 times anything is the same thing. So basically, the radical 3s cancel out. You're left with the 2 and the 8 multiplying together to get 16. The radical 3 that you still see in the numerator, it doesn't cancel or anything. You can only cancel one radical 3 for one radical 3. So the other radical 3, as well as the 7 in the denominator, just tag along and become part of the final answer. In question 2, we have another set of binomials that are being multiplied together. That means you have to set up the box again. And this time, I'm going to show you how to do the exact same logic with only using the, expo the exponential form instead of the radical form like we did up here. Keep in mind, before I do this problem, you can go ahead and rewrite the entire thing in radical form so that it says the square root of 12 times the square root of 2 plus the square root of 3. And then the other set of parentheses will have the square root of 2 minus the square root of 3. And basically, this problem is now the exact same idea as problem 1 from above. And you could do the same procedures to get the same answers. But I want to explain another way of doing this using the exponent laws, which you should also be very familiar with. So we're just going to continue using the, uh, the same procedure that I set up right here, keeping everything in exponential form. You will notice that I already set up the 2 to the power of 1 half, which is found in the first binomial, and the positive 3 to the power of 1 half. Across the top, I'm going to put the other 2 to the power of 1 half, but this time it is a negative 3 to the power of 1 half, which you can see right there. Next, you begin by multiplying to get each one of the boxes filled out. Now pay attention very carefully because this is going to cover the exponential laws. You are multiplying the same base, 2 and 2. You do not write 4. Even though that's 2 times 2, we are in fact raising these 2's to the power of 1 half. Because we are multiplying 2 to the power of 1 half by another copy of 2 to the power of 1 half, instead of multiplying your 2's, you instead will add your exponents together because that is the multiplying exponents rule. Whenever you are multiplying the same base, it says 2 and 2, you instead add the exponents together to rewrite your new answer. So basically, you have 2 to the power of 1 half plus 1 half. 1 half plus 1 half is 2 over 2, which will just become the number 1. But I'll leave it as 2 over 2 for right now, just because. In the bottom right corner, the same procedure is happening. You have a base of 3 and then another base of 3. So you are basically multiplying again. But rather than multiplying your 3s, you add the exponents. 1 half plus 1 half is again 2 over 2. Notice how the 3 is negative right here in our answer. That is simply because the negative 3 from the top right box, uh, technically that is a negative 1 that is multiplying 3 to the power of 1 half. 
So you still have the same base, 3 and 3. There's just a negative 1 multiplying the entire answer after you do the exponent rule. In your top right and bottom left boxes, you have the product 2 to the power of 1 half times 3 to the power of 1 half. And then, again, uh, the negative sign represents a negative 1. So you get the same expression, only the negative version of it. Because you're still multiplying the uh, 2 to the power of 1 half and 3 to the power of 1 half. But because the 3 has a negative 1 in front of it, you have a negative answer. This will come into play when we combine all of our like terms. Now to write down what we have. 2 to the power of 2 over 2, well, that's the same thing as 2 to the power of 1. And anything to the first power stays the same. So we just have a 2. Likewise, the negative 3 in the bottom right box is being raised to the power of 2 over 2. 2 over 2 again becomes the number 1. So we're raising negative 3 to the first power, which is just going to be negative 3. Your middle terms, notice the negative sign in front of the 2 makes these terms the opposite. You have the positive 2 to the power of 1 half times 3 to the power of 1 half, and then you have the negative 2 to the power of 1 half times 3 to the power of 1 half. Anytime you combine two terms that are opposites, you get 0. So basically, that diagonal term isn't going to even be part of our answer because it was just equal to zero. You're adding two things that are opposites. Notice how you have two and three. They both have the same exponents. And then over here, you have negative two and three, and they have the same exponents. These terms are opposites. And because they are opposites and you are adding them together, they will equal zero. So that is why you do not see them written over here. All we have is the 2 and the negative 3. Well, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. And again, if you weren't able to complete this using the exponential form, I certainly hope you made all of your terms into radicals and just did it the way that we did it up here. In any case, the last part of the problem is this. Your negative 1 is not the final answer. You have a 12 to the power of 1 half in front multiplying your negative 1. So what you need to do is rewrite your 12 to the power of 1 half as a square root of 12 using power over root. The power was 1, so 12 is being raised to the first power, and you're taking the second root of it. So that's why you see the square root sign right there. But then, because you're multiplying it by negative 1, it becomes a negative 1 times the square root of 12. But the negative 1 doesn't have to be written there. You can simply leave a negative sign. You're almost done with the problem. The square root of 12 can be simplified. You can rewrite it as the negative square root of 4 times the square root of 3. And the square root of 4 is, of course, 2. So you have a negative 2 and then the square root of 3. And that is the final answer. Again, you could have rewritten this entire problem using radicals, and you still would have gotten the same exact answer. And I certainly hope you can go back and do that to make sure you understand how to use the box technique to multiply two binomials together. Problem 2b, much more straightforward. You will notice that we have 27 to the power of 1 third in the denominator, meaning you are taking the cubed root of 27 to the first power. The cube root means what number times itself times itself is going to equal 27. And because 3 times 3 times 3 equals 27, the cube root of 27 is 3. So go ahead and rewrite the entire problem. We have 12 in the numerator. 2 to the power of 1 half can be rewritten as a radical 2. And then the 3 that we just recalculated over here can go in the denominator. 12 is being divided by 3 because they are whole numbers. A lot of you today in class were asking, do I subtract? The answer is no. 12 is in the numerator. 3 is in the denominator. This bar means you are dividing. You are dividing 12 by 3. You do not subtract them. The only time subtraction will come into play is if you have exponents. 
but there are no exponents, so we are not doing any of that subtraction. We are simply doing 12 divided by 3, which is 4. The radical 2 tags along, and that is the final answer to problem 2b. Next, in number 3, you are going to be multiplying the same base together. It says 9 to the power of 1 half times 9 to the power of 1 half. The same base is being multiplied. So that means you add the exponents together. And 1 half plus 1 half gives you 2 over 2. 2 over 2 reduces to 1. And anything that is raised to the first power is equal to itself. We're trying to determine the value of x. x is going to be the root that is on the 81. But remember, we're trying to make whatever root that we're taking of 81 equal the number 9. Can you think of what that root's going to be? Well, if you thought the number 2, then you were correct, because 9 times 9 is 81. The same number times itself. So that means we only have two copies of the number 9, so we are taking the second root of, no, of 81. So that means the value for x is going to be 2. All right, question 4 we're going to do on this other slide right here. Uh, the first thing you would want to realize is that the right-hand side of this equation, you can do a lot of simplifying right in the beginning. And if you do all that simplifying in the beginning, the answer will become very apparent when you get to the left-hand side of the equation as well. Here's the first thing you can do. In the numerator, we have a 2 and then a radical 8. You can rewrite the radical 8 as radical 4 times radical 2. Next, 49 is being square-rooted. The square root of 49 is 7. The denominator is going to stay the same. And then also notice, going with our fraction rules that you should already be familiar with from previous years, we have the same factor in both the numerator and the denominator, that factor being the square root of 2. Because everything in the numerator is being multiplied together, we are allowed to cancel the common factors. The square root of 2's can both be canceled. Additionally, notice the 2's in the numerator and denominator are also being multiplied, meaning we can cancel them in our fraction as well. So the only thing we have left at this point is the square root of 4, which we can just rewrite as 2, and then times 7, because the 7 was already there. 2 times 7 is equal to 14, so the entire right-hand side of this equation is equal to the number 14. Now we need to go and adjust the left-hand side of the equation. Notice that 16 is being raised to the power of 1 fourth. That means we're taking the fourth root of 16, so we are being asked the question, what number times itself times itself times itself equals 16? And that number would be 2, because 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. Four twos, because we were looking for the fourth root. Next, because we have a z to the power of 1 half, and because it is multiplying the radical, or the, uh, the, the 16 to the power of 1 fourth, we can use the commutative property and rearrange this so that the 2 is in front and we can change the z to the power of 1 half into a radical z. The 14 will now be written on the right-hand side, and we're almost done with the problem. Our goal now is to figure out the value of z. So we have to get it alone. Because we are multiplying by 2 right there, you will need to divide both sides by 2, and 14 divided by 2 is going to equal 7. The 2's on the left-hand side cancel out. So we're almost done. We are being asked, the square root of some number, z, is going to equal 7. And because when you take the square root of 49, you get 7, 49 is going to be our answer for number 4. Number 5. You are trying to prove that these two sides of the uh, equal sign are equivalent. And here's the first thing that you could do. Many ways you could go about getting this answer, but here's the, uh, here's the first way you could do it. The radical 8 times radical 2, you could just multiply 8 and 2 and get 16. So you have the square root of 16, which will eventually become 4. But I'll get to that in a moment. 
On the right-hand side, you have a 10 minus 3 times 4 to the power of 1 half, but go ahead and rewrite the 4 to the power of 1 half as radical 4. Anytime you can change powers into, uh, into radicals, that is a very good idea just because it'll help with a lot of the simplifying. Well, the radical 16, that becomes 4. And then the radical 4 is going to become 2. You always have to multiply before you subtract. So that means you need to do 3 times 2 first, which is 6. And then 10 minus 6 is what you would do next, and you would get 4. Because the square root of 16 equaled the 4 on the left side, and because we just calculated the other 4, we have now proven that both sides of this equation are equal. Problem 6 will be done on the next slide because I rewrote it with a lot more room, so let's just move on to number 7. You're trying to find the area of a parallelogram. You need to remember that the area of a parallelogram is the same thing as the area of a rectangle. You just do base times height. You are being told that the area is equal to 8 times the square root of 90, the area on the left-hand side of the equation. The base is 2 times the square root of 5, as it says right there, and you're multiplying that by the height, but we don't know the height, so that's why we're going to write down h. Well, our goal is to figure out the height, and we have a 2 times the square root of 5 multiplying the height. So we have to use inverse operations. Because we are multiplying by 2 times the square root of 5, we must divide both sides of the equation by 2 times the square root of 5. When you divide both sides by 2 radical 5, the 8 and the 2 will divide to make a 4, and the radical 90 will be divided by radical 5 to make radical 18. You can always divide radicals. On the, left hand, on the right hand side, your 2's and your 5's both cancel out, leaving you with just the h to write down on the right hand side. And then before you're done, your radical 18 can be rewritten as radical 9 times radical 2, because radical 9, well that's a perfect square. So you will change radical 9 to a 3, and then the radical 2 is just going to tag along. 4 times 3 is 12, so the answer is 12 radical 2. Moving right along, on, on the next slide, we will have the answer to number 6, where you are just finding the area of a rectangle. Remember, area of a rectangle is base times height, so we will just be multiplying these dimensions together. But let's take a look at the, uh, the next slide. So here's what you have. Before you want to start your multiplying, you're going to want to simplify your radicals. And you will notice up here in the 4 radical 12, radical 12 can be rewritten as radical 4 times radical 3. Anytime you have a perfect square that divides a number, you need to simplify the radical of that number. So the 4 stays the same, but the radical 4 is going to become a 2, which is multiplying the 4 from the front. So 4 times 2 is going to be 8, so you have an 8 radical 3 that you're now working with. Radical 125, well, 125 is the same thing as 25 times 5, and 25 is a perfect square. So you take the square root of 25, which is 5, and then the radical 5, the 5 that is still under the radical sign, that just tags along. So here's our new situation. We are multiplying the length and the width of this rectangle. We just calculated that radical 125 is really 5 radical 5, which I have written right here. This is the length of the rectangle, and it is going to multiply the width. The width is our expression right here. But keep in mind, we just rewrote 4 radical 12 as 8 radical 3. But because this is representing the entire width of the rectangle, it has to stay in parentheses, which is why you see it written that way over here. So the situation we're in is this. 5 radical 5 is multiplying this binomial. That means you have to use the distributive property. The 5 is going to multiply 3 and give you 15. Radical 5 times radical 5 is just 5. 5 is going to multiply negative 8 to make negative 40. And then radical 5 will multiply radical 3, and that's going to make radical 15. 
Your last step is to multiply 15 and 5 to get 75. And then the minus 40 times radical 15, well, that stays the same. There is no more simplifying you can do to the square root of 15. I will also take this moment to acknowledge that the value, if you were to simplify this, is going to be negative. Whoops. It's going to be a negative answer, and in general, you are not supposed to have a negative value for area. But for the sake of this exercise, you were just trying to multiply this expression together. So it is all right if you got a negative value for your final answer. It was the procedure that the, uh, that the question really wanted you to learn. All right, a couple more problems. Now let's talk about rational and irrational numbers. Listen carefully, because I'll briefly review what they are. A rational number is going to be all of your fractions. Irrational numbers are going to be the square roots of numbers that are not perfect squares, like 11, or the square root of 43. Oops, little typo there, 43, there we go. So, uh, we've already gone over a lot of this in class, so I'm just going to recap the major points on this, uh, on this video. Uh, number one, the sum of a rational number and a rational number is rational. That is, of course, always true. If you add two whole numbers together, you still get a whole number. If you add two fractions together, you still get a fraction. It is going to be uh, a rational number plus a rational number that's always rational. The sum of a rational number and an irrational number, that is always going to be irrational. Anytime you add an irrational number to a problem, it is going to result in an irrational answer, assuming, of course, that first answer was rational. The sum of an irrational number and another irrational number is irrational. That is sometimes true. Here's an example of when it is not true. Let's say you have the square root of 2, with, which is irrational, and you are adding that to the negative square root of 2. Well, anytime you add a number to its negative, you get a value of 0. And 0 is a very rational number. And this question was asking us, if you add two irrational numbers, is the answer always irrational? And that answer is no. Sometimes it is irrational. Like if you did the square root of 3 plus the square root of 5. That answer is irrational. But again, if you did something like the square root of 5 over 3 that is negative plus positive square root of 5 over 3, that answer is still 0. I'll also take this point to note, uh, we have fractions right here. But because you have radical 5 in the numerator and radical 5 is irrational, the entire fraction is going to be irrational. So I guess it'd be worthwhile to correct what I said. Uh, not all fractions are going to be rational because if there is an irrational part to that fraction, the entire number will be irrational. Uh, moving on, the product of a rational number and another rational number is rational. That is always true. The product of a rational number and an irrational number is irrational. That is sometimes true. Here's an example of when that doesn't happen. If, let's say, you have the square root of 17 times 1, anything times 1 is itself. So the square root of 17, which is irrational, times 1, it's still the square root of 17. So it's still irrational. But let's say you have the square root of 17 times 0. Well, anything times 0 is 0, and 0 is a rational number. So it is sometimes true that if you multiply a rational and irrational, the answer is not always irrational. Lastly, when you multiply an irrational and an irrational, the answer is always irrational. That is also sometimes true. Let's say you have an irrational 5, radical 5, and you multiply it by the square root of 20, which is also irrational. 5 times 20 is going to be 100, and the square root of 100 is equal to 10, and 10 is a rational number. Keep in mind, all of your irrational numbers are the square roots that aren't perfect squares. So let's say you took the square root of, like, 36. Well, that answer is 6, and that's rational. But if you took the square root of 35, 35 is not a perfect square. So that answer would be an irrational number.
I have gone over this question kind of quickly with not giving you a lot of examples, so please, by all means, if you do have further questions about the difference between rational and irrational numbers, come in and ask me, and I'll do what I can to give you some help. One last question. Select all of the following expressions that result in a rational number. So you basically have to simplify each one of these to see what you get. The first question, the square root of 49 minus the square root of 16. 49 square rooted is 7. The square root of 16 is 4. And 7 minus 4 is 3. 3 is a rational number. The second expression, radical 5 plus radical 6 plus radical 7 plus radical 8. None of those are perfect squares. You are adding them all together. They are all irrational numbers. So that means your answer will still be irrational. That is not a rational answer. The third one, it's a little tricky to see, but here we go. 10 times, the, uh, 10 times pi minus pi times the square root of 100. The square root of 100 is 10. And because pi is multiplying the 10, you can use the commutative property to flip them around and rewrite 10 in front of pi. Notice, 10 times pi is the same 10 times pi right here, but I flip them around using the commutative property. Anything subtracted by itself is going to equal 0. And because 0 is a rational number, 10 pi minus 10 pi is equal to 0. So it is rational. The fourth example, you are multiplying two binomials together, meaning you have to do the box again. Pi and negative radical 3 can go on one side, and then pi and positive radical 3 can go on the other. When you multiply pi times pi, you get pi squared. Negative, three, negative radical 3 times pi is negative radical 3 times pi, and positive radical 3 times pi gives you positive radical 3 times pi. Lastly, negative radical 3 times positive radical 3 is going to give you a negative 3. Radical 3 times radical 3 is a whole number of 3, and there is a negative 1 in front of the radical 3 multiplying it. So that's why we have a negative 3 right here. You just combine all of your like terms, but it's pretty easy to see that uh, even though our diagonal terms will cancel out to make 0, you have a pi squared. And pi squared is going to be an irrational number. It's just pi times itself. Pi is already an irrational number. Squaring it doesn't make it become rational again. So this entire expression will be an irrational number when, when all is said and done. The fifth example, radical 11 minus 4, because of the radical 11, which is not a perfect square, the entire expression will not be rational. The second to last answer, for the same reason as the box problem right here, you are not going to have a rational number. You are adding 5 to pi squared, and pi squared is irrational. And then lastly, r plus s, where r and s are irrational numbers, well, even though r could be radical 11 and s could be negative radical 11, both of those are irrational numbers. And if you add radical 11 to negative radical 11, you get 0. Even though 0 is a rational number, the fact that we don't know for sure, we don't know if maybe they are the opposite radical number, rational, or irrational numbers, we're, we're just not sure because we don't have enough information, we cannot conclude that R and S are opposite irrational numbers. So, so more likely, r is like the square root of 5, and s is the square root of, of 10. The answer to that would be irrational, because both 5 and 10 are not perfect squares. So because there is not enough information, we are not able to conclude that r and s could make a rational number, so that is why the answer is still no. Uh, you, you cannot conclude that that is a rational number. So that brings us to the end of this classwork. I certainly hope this helped. I know some things might have been glossed over, and it's just to kind of uh, get the information out there. And I certainly hope that if you do have additional questions, you can either leave a comment or come in and ask for help, and I will do whatever I can to uh, get you where you need to be. All right, study up for the quiz, guys, and I will talk to you soon. See you later.